Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Hero. Hey, hey, how's everyone doing? We're living in some strange times. I really hope we find a way to end racism in the U.S. and the world, and I hope justice is served for that horrible police officer. I'm here in L.A. and just tried to go to the post office and found that it was closed, and storefronts in the Venice slash Marina del Rey area were being boarded up. We all got messages to our phones saying a curfew would be enforced at 5 p.m. My friend got beat up in Santa Monica for trying to stop looters. I don't know why he was trying to do this, but it looked pretty scary. Violence is not the answer. I hope everyone stays safe and we make some changes in our society. Sorry if I sound a little dreary, it's hard to get excited in these weird times. Today we have Dr. Kate Shanahan back on the show. There's a few great people who have made it on twice. Dr. Ted Naiman, Ivor Cummins, Dr. Paul Saladino, and I'm talking to Dr. Bill Schindler again tomorrow. Please go back and catch these awesome repeat guests, as well as all the other great episodes in the back catalog. For those who don't know of Dr. Kate, she was just on Bill Maher's show Real Time where she talked about ancestral nutrition, avoiding seed oils, running on fat, and staying healthy as a number one goal during the time of the coronavirus. It was such a treat to hear someone from our health community make it to the mainstream. Bill seemed to support her message 100% and didn't even start with his plant-heavy leaning ideas. I was just so excited to see her spreading these messages I wanted to have her back on. I also have been reading her new book, The Fat Burn Fix, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. She goes into a lot of interesting details of her new information in this episode. Don't forget to get your orders in for Nose to Tail this week. We still have some in stock. If you haven't heard about it yet, all the info is on nosetotail.org. We ship out grass-fed, grass-finished, beyond organic beef, buffalo, and high omega-3 and low omega-6 pork and chicken. It's from our small ranch in Texas and shipped out to the 48 contiguous U.S. states. We have all kinds of organs mixed into ground meat products, the bones, sausages, even beef jerky and beef sticks. Check out all the great stuff at nosetotail.org. I'd also like to give all you listeners first access to the new Sapien tribe. We're making our cult official. Just joking, but we have a special lifetime access deal on sapien.org right now, especially for Patreon supporters and podcast listeners. We're going to expand our offering from the normal Patreon perks and add a lot more exclusive content and features. Learn more about it at sapien.org. Thanks for being a part of the Sapien community, and please enjoy this week's episode with Dr. Kate Shanahan. Okay, here we are, Dr. Kate Shanahan, back for round two. Hi, Brian Sanders. I'm glad to be here. Survived round one. It was it was a battle. <laughs> <laughs> we just went over what we talked about last time, and it was quite a lot. Yeah, good stuff. Well, I know there's some more good stuff to talk about because I have your new book, and we talked about it last time, how you're coming out with the Fat Burn Fix, and I'm in the middle of it. It's awesome. And I also saw you on Bill Maher, which was really cool. It was really a thrill to be on his show. It was intimidating. He's like a interview hero where I love his show. We catch like every segment. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I feel like I'd be super nervous if I ever made it on there. But it was really cool that he, his message has been great these days. The prior week where he was talking about don't say you're a hero for sitting around watching TV and that we shouldn't be doing this fat acceptance movement, that we should focus on our diet and our health and not just say you can be healthy if you're morbidly obese, that's not a great message, right? Oh yeah. I mean, he's such a, Bill Maher is such a thought leader. That's what I love about him because, you know, he's responding to this whole blowback from fat shaming, right? So there's been this thing forever where people who are overweight get singled out as being somehow, you know, morally lapsing. A big portion of the population went to some other side and said, no, we're, we're fine as, we want to be overweight or, or something like that. And I think so what he's responding to is let's stop lowering the bar on health because maybe, you know, some people are happy with being obese, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy. So let's not confuse the two. And I think that's a very important message. And what I would say in response to like, what would be a nice thing that the whole movement, if they would open their eyes to the possibility that, I mean, both sides, right? The people who do the fat shaming 
don't understand that there's actually a metabolic problem that is unique to our time that is driving this obesity epidemic. And that's, that is actually what the whole fat burn fix is about. It's to try to help folks understand, look, we are in a unique era in human history because we've been eating these seed oils that nobody's talking about them. We don't even realize that we are eating them. And there's almost no opportunity for doctors or patients to understand how those seed oils are impacting their health specifically their metabolism. And so what I did with a fat burn fix is I tried to get the message out that if you've not been avoiding these seed oils like the plague, then chances are you don't even know who you are just yet because your metabolism is so impaired by the fact that these things are have built up in your body fat. And they've changed the way your brain works and they've changed your appetite. They change your moods. And so there's just so much good health that's waiting for you once you start getting them out of your your body and your habits and your life. Yeah. It's such a great message. And I've had a lot of great people, doctors and people come on the show talking about the seed oils lately, but also the fact that it's not really their fault because they don't, all these people in America or the world are eating all these bad foods and, you know, maybe the seed oils are the worst of them and they don't know that they're the problem. So that's, it's all back to the fat shaming. Fat shaming is not good. No one should do it, right? There's a difference between fat right. shaming. And also I did a tweet that's very similar to kind of your sentiment. And I, you know, in some of the first pages I've read that it's not your moral failings. It's not that you are a slob, that you're overweight. It's you have the wrong information. You have the broken metabolism from the wrong information. Exactly. And chances are really good that you have unhealthy fats in your body fat. So I like to think about our body fat that just like any other organ in the body can become dysfunctional, right? So we talk about, you know, Alzheimer's is brain dysfunction and people who are on dialysis, we know they have kidney dysfunction, but we've actually created dysfunctional body fat by force feeding people these, the hateful eight seed oils. And because they have built up in our body fat, they've actually totally deranged that organ, namely our body fat, so that your, your body fat isn't your friend at all the way it's supposed to be, right? Like, believe it or not, when I graduated medical school a number of years ago now, being obese had not yet been established as a risk factor for anything bad happening Mm. to your health other than the mechanical aspects of it. Like, well, the fact that your knees have to bear more weight and you have more skin folds, but that's it. It was not increased mortality was not associated with being overweight just yet. Now you fast forward a number of decades and now we know that we, not only is there increased mortality, but like the next generation of children that is more overweight is, has a shorter lifespan by like two decades. Mm. Well, I'm glad we're finally figuring this stuff out and you go into these details and why, I mean, you, you maybe you can talk more about why these seed oils are bad or how they work in your cells and your membranes of your cells. It's the seed oils are bad because they are unstable because their fatty acids are unstable. So when you're talking about fat, you're talking about something that's made out of fatty acids. So we've heard of saturated fat and that's supposedly the bad fat, right? That's in animal mm-hmm. fats and butter um, it's in steak. There's a lot of it in butter and steak compared to how much saturated fat is in, for example, one of the hateful eight seed oils like corn oil. There's very little saturated fat in there. There's a lot of polyunsaturated fat in there. So it's these unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids that are causing all of the health problems that are associated with obesity and diabetes. They are basically calling causing all of metabolic disease, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, because the chemistry of them is just so unnatural And what they do to us is they promote inflammation so that like when, for example, when you eat a salad dressing that's made with soy oil, right? That soy oil is contains toxic breakdown products of what was a normal polyunsaturated fatty acid. And now that soy oil is going to be delivering not just 
polyunsaturated fatty acids that exist in nature, but some weird chemicals that don't exist in nature and that our bodies really can't handle and we have nasty reactions to, uh, that a lot of folks actually get heartburn when they eat foods that are made with these oils. Because the first point of contact when soy oil or corn oil enters your body, digestive system, right? So you swallow it and it starts aggravating your stomach and you can start getting like heartburn. You can start feeling like nausea. And a lot of folks attribute when they go out to eat and like let's say they'll have a pizza or something that has tomato sauce in it because doctors have no clue about these oils the doctors will have told them, oh, well, you know, it's the acid in the tomato. Mm. And, yeah. but that's actually not the problem at all. In fact, if you had a pizza made with olive oil and you still had as much acid in the tomato, but there was no seed oil in there, you could probably do just fine and enjoy a slice. Well, this is 100% correct in my you know, experience too, is I used to get heartburn all the time. And then I just stopped eating all these seed oils and I've never gotten it again. And I, yeah, I, I eat very acidic foods and it's completely fine. Yeah, I went, uh, my husband and I, we went out to a sushi restaurant. And so the sushi's great. Raw fish is great. No, no fats to worry about in there. But he wanted to get a salad for some reason. And uh, the salad dressing was made out of, they said it was, we always uh, grill the servers to find out what exactly they're making. So it, that's how I make the decision of what I'm going to order. So he was like, oh, you're such a freak with this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to have a salad. And by the way, I'm going to have some deep fried tempura, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm tired of avoiding, I'm tired of it. Like it, it's kind of like you can't go out to eat. You can't eat like a normal person, right? So mm -hmm. he was just like, he wanted to break from all that. And so I had a little tiny bite of the salad with the, some dressing on it. And by the time we walked home from the restaurant half an hour later, my stomach was gurgling and mm. he, his stomach was upset too. So uh, that was kind of the last time he um, <laughs> had that little rebellion. He hasn't done it since. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do that as well. I do that sometimes too, where I, I do that rebellion thing and I, I'm like, I just want to live like a normal person. And then I always feel bad after. But I thought it was really interesting to go back to the Bill Maher thing, which I'll probably do a lot because he just kind of sparked a lot of points that I wanted to talk about. You were talking about coronavirus and the connection with the seed oils and kind of said, yeah, I mean, they're trying to blow up this thing like young, healthy people are getting sick. But I don't think I wouldn't classify these people as healthy, right? Because most people aren't healthy in America and, you know, 88% are not metabolically well, but they're also, even the healthy ones are eating all the seed oils too. And, you know, you kind of talked about that. Yeah. You can't tell if somebody's healthy based on just the fact that they aren't overweight. That's uh, I mean, that's like a message that it, I can't reiterate enough. And I, you know, I talked about it also while I was working for the Los Angeles Lakers, because all of those guys were obviously some of the most fittest people on the planet. And yet when you looked at their blood work or you asked them how they were feeling, they had serious abnormalities on blood work. And they, a lot of them were dealing with, uh, were struggling with problems from inflammation. And I talked a lot about what happened with Dwight Howard. I've talked about that before, but um, with, with Bill Maher, the point I really wanted to get across to his audience is that the best thing that right now a person could do to boost their immune system is to stop eating these seed oils because the reason actually he invited me on his show is because he had heard me say that I would stake my reputation on the idea that if you take away seed oils, you know, you just subtract them out of the American food chain going back, say, five years, just an arbitrary number. Today, we wouldn't have anyone under the age of 65 in the intensive care unit or dying from coronavirus because most of what's killing the young folks isn't the virus itself. It's the inflammation when the immune system is gets activated to eradicate the virus. So people are dying of their own immune system not functioning right. It's supposed to be just a little bit of inflammation, kind of like um, a little flamethrower kind of targeting viruses and cells infected with viruses, causing inflammation on purpose. And then we're supposed to be able to have like a fire hose dousing out that fire. But instead, because our body fat is full of these seed oils and our, our diets have been so full of them that 
uh, our cells now are too full of them. So instead of having water in that fire hose, it's like we're putting gasoline out there on a fire. So it just Mm. makes it worse. And what that translates to in the hospital is people's lungs filling up with fluid. You try to put them on a ventilator and it it barely works. I mean, I've been dealing with a patient who was hospitalized like almost two months ago and just in the intensive care unit, just could not get them off the ventilator because their lungs were so inflamed. They had filled up with fluid and they were so ineffective. That's one thing is being on the ventilator. And then there's this other thing that that causes blood clots and strokes and people look fine. And then all of a sudden they have a stroke that's called cytokine storm, but that's the same kind of concept where the immune system's just going, not able to control the inflammation that it starts on purpose in response to the virus. Mm. Well, you know, the conversation that I was having on the Bill Maher show was that nearly everybody who is under 65, who did have a serious case of corona, had an underlying metabolic condition that was just probably not diagnosed, right? Like what for those people that wrote articles about their own experience, they were like, I'm a healthy person and there's nothing wrong with me. And, you know, I had a horrible case of coronavirus. But the problem is that in this country, most people with prediabetes are not told by their doctor that they have prediabetes. Most people with fatty liver are not told that they have fatty liver. Most people with migraine aren't told that migraines are made much more frequent by inflammation. And so they have no idea that migraines are a sign that their body is too full of inflammation. So it's where we think we're healthy, a lot of folks, because we look in the mirror and we don't see what's really happening under the hood, so to speak. We can't see the inflammation per se when we look in the mirror, although there are almost always signs, like almost always, even if you're normal weight, you may have problems with, well, heartburn, for example, or headaches, frequent headaches, I've found that people who have more than about the monthly headache, like a lot of women are very, like have some kind of abnormal reaction to their own cycle, right? And unfortunately deal with migraines um, every month. But if you have migraines twice a month, that is a red flag for me that you also have a major metabolic problem with inflammation. Mm. That makes sense to me. Uh, People listening may know that I lost both my parents to these chronic diseases, even though they ate the healthy food pyramid diet. And my dad had migraines forever and would always have to take a nap and all this type of stuff that you start talking about in your book. It's like a sign of this metabolic dysfunction. Yes. And did you know that migraines, people who've had migraines for several decades, many of them, when you do a MRI brain scan, that they find like little white spots as if they've had miniature strokes all over, just like scattered all over their head. Mm. And I think that frequent migraine is actually related to such poor blood flow that what's happening, the reason that people develop these little tiny strokes is because their blood flow is not properly regulated through the brain. And they actually do have a teeny, teeny, tiny little stroke. So you don't Mm. notice anything usually you know, you don't notice, it's not like you feel like you've had a stroke, like you can't speak or anything like that, because it takes a humongous brain tissue loss for us to notice that we've had a stroke. Like the strokes that people end up in the hospital with are are pretty huge strokes, but these little teeny tiny little white matter changes that we find in many people with, with migraines were essentially a tiny bit of brain damage that you know, permanently developed along with the migraine. So I like to help people not have migraines anymore, just as aggressively as I like to have people who have diabetes cure their diabetes, because I feel that it's very, very important to, you know, prevent having your brain riddled with little teeny tiny strokes Mm -hmm. that by the time, you know, you're 50, you know, who knows what that does to a person's IQ or, you know, their cognition and their ability to, When we're 50, we really should be at our peak in our career, right? We shouldn't be like, well, I'm starting to get forgetful. That's a tragedy. So that's one I take migraines, you know, seriously, but or any sign of inflammation. Another one is allergies, like seasonal allergies. That's not always something that is going to stick with you forever. Seasonal allergies very often improve dramatically when you improve your diet. 
I had the exact same thing. I, I don't want to always just make it an anecdote or about myself because this is widespread and you see this with patients all the time. I have no more allergies anymore, changing my diet. And so tell us about it though. If your immune system is always trying to deal with this underlying inflammation from eating inflammatory foods, then it's hard to deal with all these other things. Absolutely. Your immune system is one of the most complicated systems in in your body. It is a learning system. It's always learning because we're always introducing new proteins and we're always exposed to new viruses and new microbes. So it has to be able to learn. And if our diets are full of these pro-inflammatory seed oils, then the inflammation is just getting in the way of the immune system's ability to determine the difference between you and a pathogen. Some people's immune systems uh, make a very severe mistake and they develop a kind of autoimmune disease. So that could be a Hashimoto's thyroiditis or it could be Graves disease where your own body's antibodies start attacking your thyroid. Those are both related to thyroid autoantibodies, they call them, meaning your body's attacking itself, your immune system attacking itself. And the same with celiac disease. It's not that I totally disagree. I have to say, I love William Davis and I love Perlmutter um, for their message and a lot of what they're saying, they're just doing so much good. But I totally disagree with their conclusion that it's the fact that an individual seed of wheat has more gluten than it did a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't think gluten is the problem. What is gluten? Gluten is actually not carbs. It's not fat. It's not sugar. It's actually a protein. And it's the protein in wheat that when you make dough, it makes it gluey or doughy. Mm -hmm. Um, And having a little bit more of that kind of protein, there's no logical reason that I can imagine why that should promote inflammation. And there's actually no research that shows that it promotes inflammation any more than any other protein that exists in the world than milk protein, which is a protein that is devised by nature to be nourishing. So there's a lot of misinformation around gluten. And I, you know, obviously I'm not saying there's no such thing as gluten intolerance or celiac disease. I'm saying that the reason that we're having these intolerances Uh, that we need to avoid wheat categorically. It's that we need to stop eating these pro-inflammatory seed oils because that's disrupting our immune system. It's also causing like just weird food intolerances so that so many children have extraordinarily restrictive diets. And that's a huge problem because Mm -hmm. it means their parents now are going to have a much harder time eating healthy themselves because either they're going to have to have the same restricted diet as their child or they're going to have to make two separate meals. And, you know, people have hard enough time making one meal from scratch. Yeah. So it sounds like to me, the problem is that kind of the other inflammatory foods or maybe it's the seed oils that are causing sort of intestinal permeability. And then the gluten goes through and then the body, you know, then the normal idea of the gluten intolerance of the proteins in the body, yes. not knowing the difference. Right. So it's like we blame it on gluten, but maybe the underlying, the root cause, we always want to look at the root cause is the intestinal permeability or the disrupted microbiome or whatever that's causing. Yes. And if you want to look for a culprit that can do all of those things, you need look no further than these pro-inflammatory oils because there's, I cite this in Deep Nutrition, that there's research showing that you feed mice poly, you know, diet high in polyunsaturated fatty acids and it dramatically changes their gut flora and you develop a gut flora that is associated with obesity. It's associated with anxiety. And definitely, if you have an abnormal gut flora, it's very difficult to maintain normal intestinal permeability or really any normal intestinal function. A lot of folks have stomach cramping or they have serious digestive irregularities, and that's very correlated with irritable bowel and the more serious form of irritable bowel, which is another autoimmune disorder, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Those are called inflammatory Mm -hmm. bowel. I actually ran into a study a number of years ago that suggested, according to their calculations, 30% of inflammatory bowel disease would be eliminated if people would just stop eating soy oil. And that, according to this article, 
all gastroenterologists should tell people. It should be part of the protocol. It should be part of the standard treatment of people with inflammatory bowel. And so that's like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are not super common, uh, but they're about as common as celiac disease. So somewhere around like 2% of the population, if I have my statistics right. Yeah. But you get the seed oils. I mean, so this is just like a standard doctor's magazine with just the minimal understanding of how soy oil promotes inflammation, not even like the more detailed information. Like this is just in the diet. The way I talk about it is what happens once it builds up in your body fat. So they're saying that 30% of Crohn's disease is due entirely to this oil, not to mention the other oils, right? Not to Mm -hmm. mention all the other complications that arise when it's been in your body fat for a long time. And now your immune system is disrupted you know, kind of from the inside out, right? Like, so they were talking about it, uh, the effects of it just on the superficial, like the internal gut level, not like what happens when it's your body is composed of this stuff. So I found that was an extremely interesting article and um, Mm -hmm. it hasn't been picked up by, um, you know, mainstream medicine, unfortunately. Yeah. Really a lot of people, a lot of good. I think this will happen in the next few years is people, mainstream medicine will will catch on to this, but I want to get back to this gluten stuff a little bit or just processed foods in general. It's so sad that people go gluten free and then they replace it with a whole bunch of, there's like 30 ingredients, 40, 50 ingredients in some of these gluten free products. And a lot of them are vegetable oils too. And that it's unhealthier than when you started. And I was spending some time with the family and they had a babysitter who was 17, who was like 300 pounds. And this poor girl, you know, I like trying to be healthy or, you know, doing the gluten free stuff. And she ordered like a gluten uh, burger with no bun. I was like, oh, yes, she's doing it. And then she brought out her own like gluten free bun. I'm like, oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, the I think the bigger problem is that the processed foods and well, I don't know, just people just don't have that right idea of nutrition at all. Yes. No. And and it's not people's fault. Doctors don't either. I I went through medical school um, and I learned a lot about nutrition, but I learned almost nothing about diet, like what a healthy diet is. Nutrition, when you look it up, means the process of turning nutrients into the human body. And I learned many, many, many credit hours worth of information on that topic. Like we learned about how amino acids turn into proteins and proteins turn into all your body parts, right? So that that is the science of nutrition. But what we don't learn is what is a healthy diet look like? And the whole basis of what doctors learn in medical school comes from, you know, this wildly made up I mean, it's just a made up idea that saturated fat clogs our arteries. There was never any evidence that that was the case, but it was just built into the medical literature over decades so that like when it was first proposed, the guy who first proposed it were, they were, he was laughed out of the room by a bunch of doctors because they're like, oh, come on, really, it's ridiculous. You're saying that a thing that is, composes most of our food is somehow clogging our arteries like all of a sudden when it never did that before in human history. And the doctors were kind of thinking, maybe it's cigarette smoking because that's a new thing. And it's the smokers who fall over dead, not people who don't smoke. And the man who proposed that it was saturated fat, he poo-pooed that idea. And he just ingratiated himself in the medical education system, starting with the American Heart Association back in the 1950s. His name is Ansel Keys. I'm sure you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like that is such an important part of our American history because it has had this legacy of nutritional misinformation and dietary misinformation. And what it did really is it, it blinded us to two very important things. You know, one is we've known what a healthy human diet is. We've always known. We just didn't teach it in medical school. It was kind of a given. It's what your grandmother ate. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's traditional cooking that doesn't involve candy, right? Because uh, 150 years ago, there was pretty much no such very little candy, right? Mm -hmm. And so most of what people ate came off the land. It came from a farm and that a healthy, viable farm was its own ecosystem that 
drove the production of healthy food that would be built into a healthy, naturally balanced diet based on the science of using the ecosystem to produce stuff that humans wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. And so actually health begins on the farm, right? Health begins with farming. And I think one of the things that is really interesting that's happened in this whole underground nutrition world movement has to do with with the fact that we kind of overlook farming we, or like we, we say that farming equates to wheat, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have to go back to what people used to eat in the Paleolithic era if we really want to be healthy. And I think that's missing a humongous uh, body of information of the connection between you know, farming and health and what is a sustainable farm. And that's a huge, important discussion that I wished I had time to get into with Bill Maher, because I know he is repulsed by the way that we produce animal, most mm-hmm. animal products in this country, because our whole idea of farming is now repulsive. I mean, 95% of farms, and I'm, I'm kind of just making up that number because I, I don't really know what mm-hmm. proportion of farms are like the Joe Salatin, the diversified farm that where it is its own little ecosystem, you know, like where you have the, the plants feed the animals and then the animals produce feed the manure that feeds yeah. the plants. You build up these, this healthy fungus in the soil. So you're actually not removing from the soil in the end, but you're adding to it so that a farm piece of well-maintained farm actually makes the land healthier over time. And so that the more that this society farms, the healthier that they can be. And so that's where you get the whole Weston Price and his discovery of people um, who had been farming or um, herding and gathering in the same area for a long time are just, we're just so extraordinarily healthy that um, you wouldn't even believe it. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a great topic. I actually presented on this in Low Carb Denver, right before the lockdown. And I also just reposted a clip of an interview I did with John and Molly Chester from The Biggest Little Farm. So I don't know if you've seen this documentary. Uh, I want to plug it again because it's great. It's exactly what you're talking about. It's a whole film about this couple that made a farm exactly how it's supposed to be done, where it's a perfect harmonious cycle with plants and animals working together. You know, obviously no fertilizers and all like monocrops, anything like that. It's all whatever, biodynamic, regenerative, organic, and it all works together. And that's how you make healthy food. And yes, I don't think we all need to be you know, like paleo. It's like, oh, we got to go back and like only eat was around in the paleo era. I think a lot of people get stuck in sort of dietary camps. And my job, I feel, is to not get stuck in any camp and look at all sides. And And I'm talking to Dr. Bill Schindler again, who I had on the podcast before, who talked about this and how well how humans evolved eating meat and animal foods were highly prized and Western price stuff, but also how we always prepared foods traditionally and had ways to eat them well and that we can eat dairy now because even though it wasn't around in the paleo era because we ferment it outside of the body and do things to it you know that make it more digestible or we can eat grains now because traditionally prepared grains are soaked and fermented and sprouted and all that kind of stuff so i guess there's just a lot of nuances to this stuff (laughs) yeah absolutely and uh, you know i built all of that into the meal plans that are in the fat burn fix, because what I want people to get from the fat burn fix itself and from this conversation is that the main thing that's killing us is metabolic disease. The granddaddy, or actually really the Darth Vader of all metabolic disease is diabetes. That's kind of like the end stage of metabolic disease. You get to this point where you have type two diabetes, where your body produces insulin and you don't, you're not responsive to it. You have massive amounts of insulin and almost nothing in your body is working the way it should be anymore. And that's, you know, if somebody's had type two diabetes and they're now they're stuck on, they're injecting themselves with insulin and they need escalating doses of insulin, that is end stage type two diabetes. And most people can't live a normal life. They're in and out of the hospital. They start getting um, heart failure, kidney failure at that point in time. Um, That's kind of like the last stage of it. But the very beginning of it is many people in their teens are already there. 
And you, you know you are if you have this thing called hanger. Hangry is not normal. It's not normal to be dysfunctional when you need to eat because we're supposed to be able to slip right into burning your body fat. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm saying uh, with a fat burn fix, because of these seed oils, how they affect our metabolism, they're causing the vast, vast majority of all the chronic illnesses. And it all roads basically lead to type 2 diabetes. But you may start out with hypertension. You may start out with certain skin diseases like psoriasis. Uh, we may start out with gout. We may start out with kidney stones. You may start out with migraines like we talked about. But all of these are a result of your metabolism failing. And eventually you will get type 2 diabetes if you don't radically change your diet or just get the seed oils out. I mean, it, it's a lot of work to do it, but it's a very simple concept. Avoid these hateful eight seed oils. And I, I want to help make it easy for people to remember what they are. That's why I'm calling it the hateful eight and <laughs> have like this mm-hmm. little um, wanted sign uh, yeah. poster because I want people to take a picture of that. And every time they go shopping, um, pull up that picture on their phone and to every product that you're about to buy, scan the ingredients list underneath the nutrition uh, part of the label. There's an ingredients list and it lists every component of the food in order of how much is in there. So the first ingredient is what there is most of. Um, so salad dressings, even at Whole Foods, the first ingredient is always going to be water, right? Very often the second ingredient is an oil. Usually it's corn oil or soy oil. Sugar is another one, but scan everything you buy for these things. And even if you don't plan on making any changes, just get an assessment of how much you've been eating. I can't tell you how many people contacted me after that Bill Maher show to say, I had no idea (laughs) that that I was eating these things. I had no idea these things were unhealthy and I had no idea that they were in everything because these people, so many people said, I started looking at, oh my God. Because there's eight of them, right? You, it's not like a one thing that you can look for. So you're not going to realize that basically corn oil is unhealthy in the exact same way that sunflower oil is. I mean, they sound like they're totally different things, right? And mm-hmm. you also have this term that adds even more confusion called vegetable oil. And it makes it seem like it's this oil that somehow is coming out of broccoli and peas mm-hmm. and the most wholesome kind of concentrate from a vegetable that you can ever imagine, right? But I couldn't be farther from the truth. Vegetable oil is just the industry term for one of the hateful eight because they're all chemically identical and can be used pretty much interchangeably to make our, these processed foods, which are essentially junk foods. Well, it's genius marketing that someone came up with vegetable oils because, yes, it sounds good. And yeah, I mean, if people just know that industrial seed oils, they're all bad. And I'll just list off the Hateful Eight for people listening. Canola, corn, con seed, soy, sunflower, safflower, grape seed, and rice bran. So, I mean, people listening to this podcast will know to avoid all those, but you're completely right. No one in America, and I'm using no one loosely, but nobody in the mainstream <laughs> knows that these are bad they're, and they're in everything. It's almost like you could just tell someone, you don't even have to tell them to go low carb or low anything. Just say, hey, don't eat anything with these oils, any seed oils in it. And they could be healthy for life, I think, because everything <laughs> that's bad involves them, right? If you just just pretend, you're, you know, people say, oh, I'm gluten tolerant, you know, I'm, I'm gluten free. All right, be seed oil free. Right. If you just go around your life thinking you're seed oil intolerant, you can be healthy because you're going to avoid all packaged foods because they all have them. You're going to avoid all dressings. You're going to avoid so many things. You're only left with almost just whole foods. Right. And but Brian, I don't know if you realize it, but you just said something radical, um, which I agree with 100 percent. And that is that diabetes, type two diabetes, which is currently like people say, well, that's eating too much carbohydrate causes that. I don't think so. I don't know if you agree with me on that um, after reading. Oh, I on- definitely agree. I mean, I know what you're about to say and, and keep going on it, but I'm out of this carbohydrate insulin model hypothesis. I completely understand how people can eat carbohydrates and be healthy. I mean, many people should avoid carbs and sugar and it's a great way to go. And I, I love that way. And that's what I do. But I know that it's not caused by carbohydrates. Right. Great. I mean, so that's so important to understand because then it means that like, if you're a diabetic and you're, you're thinking, Oh my God, I have to change absolutely everything. I can't eat any bread. I can't eat anything I'm familiar with. I I have to change. I I, like, I'm going to freak out because I have no idea what I'm supposed to make my family for dinner tonight. Really. It's just the oils. And 
Yes, I don't think either one of us are saying that, you know, sugar is good for you and carbohydrates you can just, you know, load up on now. Mm-hmm. Because once you have developed the one of the early stages of diabetes, so in the Fat Burn Fix, they talk about how there's a, there's basically stages of diabetes, or I call it a spectrum. On that spectrum is insulin resistance. That's that's the second part of the, the whole development towards end stage type two diabetes. So insulin resistance, once you're there, once you have insulin resistance, which is a very early part, now you have an issue with carbohydrates. Now you really have to have uh, pay very close attention to what kind of carbohydrates you get, right? So whereas before you develop that, you might be able to get away with some of the more, uh, you know, the sugars, the sweet stuff, the more refined stuff, you might be able to get away with that. But um, once you've developed insulin resistance, now if you want to have carbohydrates, they really need to get into your body in a way that doesn't spike insulin. And that's very simple. You just consume them in whole foods, right? Or the traditional method of preparing bread is using not wheat flour that's been pulverized and will dramatically spike your blood sugar, but whole wheat seeds that have been sprouted and just kind of mushed into a dough and formed into baked into a bread. And I've um, been, I, you know, I've, I've tested the theory on whether or not there is a significant difference between whole wheat bread and sprouted wheat bread. And there's definitely a difference. So uh, I had a couple of patients who were insulin resistant slash pre-diabetic. It's, it's, they actually were pre-diabetic, but they were, you know, you can't be pre-diabetic without being insulin resistant. So this was a pre-diabetic person or a couple of pre-diabetic people. And I had them have the identical sandwich with their like normal bread versus the Ezekiel bread and their blood sugar. um, I was watching what their blood sugar was doing through this piece of technology called a um, continuous glucometer. See, yeah, a continuous glucose monitor. I actually wore one for nine days recently. <laughs> They're so fun, aren't they? Yeah. Um, scan one and see what's happening. Uh, yeah, I saw that like with the regular bread, her blood sugar spiked up close to 200. And with the Ezekiel bread, it got maybe up to like 120. Mm. Same, everything else was the same. Yeah. Well, and, and even better, I mean, yeah, again, Bill Schindler, he, yeah, slow ferments the sourdough overnight and talks about the same thing and how it's, it affects your body completely differently. Absolutely. So what I said in deep nutrition, I just, I mean, I don't think even though we had a conversation about this book already, but I don't think you can say it often enough. Chefs mm-hmm. were the original nutritionists. And if there's a nice restaurant and you have a good chef, by which I mean, he refuses to use the seed oils. If he's feeding you something that's carby, he's probably done something to it that is going to make it taste good using all natural ingredients, which almost always equates to good nutrition. Uh, Another kind of experiment of that concept, I work pretty closely with a chef in Los Angeles who runs a a company called Mind Body Fork. Her name's Debbie Lee. And um, she, I kind of, I consult heavily to help her create, she's very um, health conscious and she's so conscientious. She wants to always do the best thing for her customers. Um, I looked at a couple of the meals that she had constructed and I put them into chronometer without any supplement. She had exceeded the RDA of every vitamin and mineral and essential anything that chronometer tracks Mm. day after day of the meals that she was building. So she does breakfast, lunch, and and dinner for people. And that isn't without, she wasn't, I didn't even say anything about like a certain amount of protein or a certain amount of carbohydrates. I was just, don't use the seed oils and go with God if it's a traditional thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And let's Mm -hmm. not not base it on rice, which and she was on board with that because it's not exciting as a chef. It's just mm-hmm. to feed people a pile of rice or a pile of pasta. That's laziness for to a chef, to a good chef. And so like that's where the healthy diet that people used to get was like probably super duper delicious. And I just want to get people back to that because not only is it going to be great for you, um, your whole family can learn to love it if they don't love it right off the bat. <laughs> Oh yeah. Good food. That's yeah. That's how we used to live and we were all healthy and people could eat carbs, but I just want to differentiate too, because yeah, a lot of people have problems these days. Most people have problems these days. So it, the best path is probably just to go against carbohydrates, right? And not everyone's going to do all these methods of preparing them correctly. So you don't have to know because they're available now in stores, right? Oh, so that's you don't- good. 
but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but no, I, I agree. Like I wouldn't base your diet on any of it. I mean, I still recommend that unless you're an athlete, you definitely, everybody should just kind of keep all of their total daily carbs under a hundred and lower is better because relative to vegetables and nuts and seeds and dairy and eggs and meat and fish and all the other stuff, there's more calories per bite of nutrition for a lot of it. Yeah, you're going to have more nutrient-dense foods are all the ancestral foods and the traditional foods. Yeah, I always go to nutrient density too. It's just that I know they're delicious, but all these kind of bases like the rices and pastas aren't nutrient-dense. They're just, they're not great for most people and you could be getting better nutrition elsewhere. Right, exactly. And, but yeah. but um, you can do things like quinoa, right? And because a lot of folks who are vegetarian, they really rely on the starchy to a carnivore, what seems like it's very starchy, like your your quinoa and your ancient, all the ancient grains and, and that sort of stuff. And they can do very well as long as they don't pulverize it into a flour. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you have to do any special processes, but you can, you and you can sprout them and enhance them and make them even better because I don't think that most people have trouble with lectins. Now, I mean, you can definitely do better for your body by sprouting and getting neutralizing some of the anti nutrients that are in seeds. But if you don't have time for all that, as long as your digestive system's in good shape, you're okay. You don't have to turn your life upside down if that's what it feels like. And if it doesn't seem like it's worth it to you. Now, some people just have the funnest time sprouting things in their kitchen and they like the flavor profiles, the way it changes when you sprout it. And I love that attitude because that is a healthy attitude. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm taking something that's whole and natural and came from nature and I'm actually making it even more nutritious, right? Just by sprouting it, for example. But they people get excited about the process and uh, you know whether or not it will sprout. I, mean, I sprout stuff every time we make anything with beans. I like to sprout it first, just because it's like it's fun, right? And I like uh-huh. the taste. Of it. And all it takes is soaking overnight. So that takes a total of about thirty seconds to pour some stuff in a bowl and soak it. Yeah. And then drain it and you water it twice a day. So it's, it's very minimal work. Nature does most of the work. It's just that you um, have to remember to do it and think of it ahead of time. Mm-hmm. I agree though. It's fun. I started fermenting, you know, sauerkrauts and stuff like that. And I, it's just fun. Yeah. I mean, you're participating in the process. So that's cool. I want to go back to, so you mentioned like hangry. I thought that was really cool because, well, basically you keep writing these great books of all my thoughts and I, <laughs> and I'm like trying to, you know, write my own book and it, it's all about satiety. And so we're really on the same page and, you know, the whole deep nutrition is very close to the idea of sapien diet, which I didn't know, you know, you had this whole idea of the human diet already. Deep nutrition was very similar. So talk about more of that hangry stuff and how it just, yeah, your body, it's not getting fueled correctly. Right. Absolutely. And the reason ties to what happens when your body fat has been infused with so many of these polyunsaturated fats from the hateful eight, right? So over a year, when you're born, your body fat is more the composition as nature intended, um, which is to say like all other animal fat is supposed to be mostly monounsaturated fat followed by a tiny fraction of poly, somewhere around 2% to 5%. You know, hopefully children are not now being born with abnormal fatty acid profiles, but the research hasn't been done yet. But so regardless, let's just say it's still normal. Over the years, as your diet contains somewhere around, uh, somewhere between 30 and probably 60% of the average person's calories are coming from these seed oils. And so that means that as a percentage of your calories, these PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fatty acid part, constitutes somewhere between, you know, maybe 15 and 30% of your total calories that would be reflected in your body fat over a certain number of years, because you just keep eating them and eating them and your body can't do anything with them. If we only need two to 4%, then that means we only construct that small portion of our body two to 4% is made out of polyunsaturated fatty acids. But when we exceed that, there's nothing to do with them other than storm in our body fat. So over the years, our body fat gets more and more dysfunctional as these pro-inflammatory fats build up. And what I mean by dysfunctional is it doesn't fuel you between meals. It doesn't keep your energy levels up so that you get in this strange place where 
a couple hours after breakfast and all of a sudden you're hungry. Now your breakfast might've been, you know, three, 400 calories. And if you're not doing very much activity, that should easily last you till lunch. Mm -hmm. But you know, two hours later, you might be hungry depending on what you ate. That's because your body put all those calories, you know, took them out of your bloodstream quickly and put them into storage. And what's supposed to happen is that now your body fat starts releasing that stuff again. But when that happens and it's releasing too much PUFA, the PUFA is not a good fuel for your cells. And instead of producing energy, what happens is your, your cells, the little energy factories inside your cells called mitochondria, they start releasing free radicals, which promote inflammation and oxidative stress. And instead of getting energy, that cell is now running out of energy and getting only inflammation. It's, but to meet its immediate energy needs, because the cell would die in a matter of seconds if it couldn't, it has to reach for an alternative fuel. What that is, is sugar. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that somewhere around two to three hours after you ate your breakfast, which is usually a very low fat breakfast when this happens, then your, your cells are now reaching for all sugar all at once. And they're slurping sugar out of your bloodstream. And our bloodstream is only designed to hold a tiny amount of sugars. It's a, a four grams, which is about a teaspoon, is in the entire bloodstream. So that's 16 calories. So you might imagine that, you know, all of a sudden your cells are now slurping blood sugar. What's going to happen? Your blood sugar is going to drop. And what happens when your blood sugar drops? You develop hypoglycemia symptoms. You know, anybody who's um, gone to the doctor for these symptoms has been told that they have this condition called hypoglycemia, which just means in Latin, low blood sugar. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about what caused it. But most doctors will tell you, go ahead and have something to eat. It means you need to eat to regulate your blood sugar. And it makes it seem like snacking now is promoting good health. Terrible advice, because it's actually making the problem worse, especially since what you're snacking on probably be loaded with very refined carbohydrates and sugars, raise your blood sugar, spike more insulin again. So you're going to be on these energy cycles of energy highs and energy dips all day long because your body fat isn't working right. So that's what it means to be hangry. If you get hangry is kind of synonymous now with hypoglycemia symptoms. You get irritable, you can't concentrate, you get anxious, you can get sweaty. There's a couple of other symptoms. There's actually 11 symptoms that I talk about in the book, The Fat Burn mm -hmm. Fix, that I want people to start looking out for and tracking because as your metabolism improves, those symptoms will disappear. And so I want you to pay attention to how you feel when you're hungry, basically. It's very simple. You don't need any fan, you know, all these fancy tests and all that kind of stuff. Although there are some really cool tests you can get and you can do things like continuous glucometers. But really, if you just get attuned to how you feel throughout the day, your energy levels and what happens when you're hungry, you can learn some very important things. You are gauging the health of your metabolism and you're gauging your metabolic recovery. Yeah. The other important thing that I bring up and, and that I believe in and it's in the book, is that if you're metabolically damaged enough, you're not ready to lose weight. Now, that sounds like a very depressing thing to hear that, no, you know, you want to lose weight, you want to get into that bikini, um, you want to, you know, look good for your daughter's wedding or whatever. But, and I'm saying, well, you might not be ready to make that be your real goal, like for rapid weight loss or anything. If you're already having problems with hunger and energy lapses during the day on however many calories you're currently eating. And then you try to lose weight by cutting down your calories even further. That just seems like a recipe for, for failure eventually, especially if you're already insulin resistant, you know, like, I mean, I, I know a lot of people have great success just by going low carb. Those people are healthier than most people who are in their 40s and 50s and need to lose any significant amount of weight. Yeah. So this is so great. You're talking about in the book, hypoglycemia, these symptoms mean you're not burning body fat. I mean, people know that it's like people are sugar burned. You're basically explaining that you want to be metabolically flexible. You want to be fat adapted. You want to be able to burn your own body fat. And if you're constantly eating sugar, you're not tapping into your own body fat so that you can not be hangry or hypoglycemic. Exactly. I'm saying that losing this ability to burn your body fat is what causes diabetes, which is the granddaddy of all, all metabolic disease. So it pretty much 
if you can't burn your body fat, you're setting yourself up for all metabolic diseases. And I haven't even mentioned the C word cancer, but you had safe read on. So uh, um, mm-hmm. your listeners have been exposed to the idea that a lot of cancer, probably not all, but certainly the vast majority is likely due to metabolic disease. And what I just said about your body fat, not giving your cells energy. And you know, when you release your body fat, your cells can't produce energy. And instead what they do is produce free radicals. That's how you get DNA damage. That's how you take a normal functioning cell and you damage its mitochondria by doing that. And now you have a potentially a cancer cell. So I think that these seed oils explain most cancer. And and again, a lot of folks in the low carb world, which is a very good world, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I agree with the dietary premise of a lot of that, but a lot of folks talk about insulin as being the driving force of all that. And I just don't think so because you can't get insulin resistance. You can't get high insulin levels without insulin resistance. And you can't get insulin resistance very easily without the seed oils, without the excessive PUFAs. You can do it, right? You can. There's a lot of ways to create insulin resistance. This isn't the only one, but this is the easiest way. If you want to make somebody diabetic, these seed oils are the fastest route to becoming a diabetic. Yeah, it kind of comes down to the mitochondria too. I mean, that's Thomas Safer you're talking about. It all comes down to mitochondria and the same stuff with the seed oils. is It's screwing them up. Yes, Exactly. I mean, you can't have mitochondria be healthy while your body fat is full of these things. And so that leads to like a a question that I get commonly, which is, okay, I'm going to stop you. I'm sold. How long until my body fat is clear? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. From radioisotope studies that were done around the time of a lot of nuclear testing in the 50s, they discovered that half of your adipose tissue has been replaced by brand new adipose tissue in 18 months. So in about three half-lives or four half-lives, you've probably exchanged the vast majority of it, nearly 100. So that's like four or five years. And that's in a normal weight person. It may be longer in an overweight person or it may not be. But uh, so most people are coming to the conclusion that, you know, okay, yes, the answer to that question, how long until I'm totally clear is four to five years. But again, in the interest of not depressing your audience, you don't have to be totally clear to get to experience massive health improvements because there's like thresholds and the body's very resilient. And if you are fortifying your antioxidant enzymes. And I talk about the supplements, uh, just a few little cheap supplements that help you do that most effectively. If you are eating the most nutrient dense foods, you're going to be able to deal with a low level of inflammation and PS you're having less inflammation, right? So because you're eating less and less of these things and you're, you're having a higher fat diet and you're burning more of what I call them the clean burning fats, like the healthy fats that are in butter and you know, whole foods, fats, they burn cleanly in your mitochondria without producing that nasty cellular smog that called reactive oxygen species that um, causes inflammation. And even better is like, once you start eating these clean burning fats, you're not on an energy roller coaster, you don't get hangry. So that alone is going to improve your, you know, your day um, on day one, starting from day one. Yeah. Oh, so that's why you kind of mentioned in Bill Maher, the five years avoiding seed oils that you kind of would stake your reputation on someone not getting a severe case of COVID. Yes. Yeah, actually. So yeah, there was science. But yeah, but you could get half of them out in a year and a half. And yeah, I mean, it's just good to know that just start avoiding them now. And uh, I like that. Like you don't have to be insane and like be depressed if you have one bite of salad with some salad dressing, but (laughs) yeah, just get them out. There's a few more things that he brought up needing sun and needing germs. I think this is really great that he talked about, and you didn't really get a chance to respond to that on his show, but I've been talking a lot about vitamin D and getting the sun. I'm also, I didn't really talk about too much about the germ aspect of, I love germs. I don't really wash my hands. I'm like curling up with my dog who's super dirty. My strategy to fight off COVID or whatever people are trying to do is the opposite of what everyone's trying to do. Everyone, they're telling us to stay indoors and just Purell everything. I'm out there doing what I can to get sun and be exposed to germs. 
I want germs. Like this is how the immune system works is it builds up by have, being challenged. Absolutely. And it's a much safer bet that it's going to work out the way you want it to work out when you are not full of these, you know, pro-inflammatory seed oils, right? Because that, that inflammation is just, I, you know, I just can't tell you how um, much it gets in the way of your immune system functioning. Oh, yeah. Doing should, right for you. Sorry. Yeah. We should say that too, because I am <laughs> metabolically healthy, I am not worried, but yeah, if someone has all these other underlying problems, maybe they shouldn't be doing what I'm doing, but keep going. <laughs> but yeah, I totally agree with you. In fact, there's, you know, some reason to believe that, um, that, that we get like micro vaccinations, um, when we go outside and breathe other people's germs, right? So let's say we're talking about, um, just an ordinary cold, right? Not something that's mm-hmm. so emotionally charged as the coronavirus or politically charged. Mm-hmm. Just ordinary. Somebody sneezes on you and, um, now you just been like loaded up with a whole bunch of viruses. Say maybe you got like a thousand particles of virus. Viral um, load. Yeah. Big viral load. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A healthy body has, we're, we've got all this mucus in our upper respiratory system, in our sinuses and the back of our throat and saliva. That's therefore is to wash viruses down in part, right? And, and so it where does it wash them? It washes them into our digestive system. Our immune system starts in our digestive system. And so now you've just swallowed these viral particles, which hopefully your stomach acid is inactivating, right? So that it's denaturing the proteins uh, that the viral capsules are made out of so that the virus isn't going to be able to infect you anymore. But now you have a whole bunch of viral protein, which can act as an antigen. Like it can train the immune system of your gut to recognize this protein again in the future so that you may actually be like some kind of micro vaccination might be happening. We do know that like polio virus, for example, the um, original vaccine for polio was a sugar pill. And those sugar pills were far more effective in producing immunity against polio than the injected vaccine, which came out much later. There's reason to believe that all kinds of amazing. I mean, I just totally made that up. Like, I'm I'm not basing any what I said about like the microdosing. Mm-hmm. It's not like I cite like a journal or anything yeah, like yeah. that. But our immune system is so smart, and we have these different types of antibodies, IgA versus IgG, and all layers of like different patrol cells looking for um, foreign antigens all throughout our body, and nowhere is it more complicated and more invested with immune cells than in our gut. And so I have to believe that, you know, there is some technology in a healthy immune system that actually there is a benefit of being lightly exposed to uh, pathogens below the infectious dose, Mm -hmm. right? There's an infectious dose that you have to have and every virus is different. Some viruses have a super high infectious dose, and um, and those tend actually to be the most aggressive viruses, like the Spanish flu of 1918. It seemed like it had a very high infectious dose. Uh, but anyway, so if you're talking about a virus that has a, a high infectious dose, then these micro doses are actually potentially protecting you. So it may be good to do what Sweden's doing in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Which is exciting, yeah, actually, because they they may actually end up winning in the end. I mean, you know, it's all a gamble. Nobody really knows. We haven't played out this this experiment before. But the whole idea of flattening the curve wasn't necessarily to reduce mortality from the virus. I I don't know if anybody understands that. Very many people understand that. It was to not overwhelm the capacity of the intensive care units. Nobody guaranteed that flattening the curve was going to lead to fewer cases. Yes, yes. Thank you for saying that. The the area under the curve is the same. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're just flattening it. The area under the curve is the same. No, that's what was really confusing me. It's like we flatten the curve, you know, it's successful, but why are we still locked down? The hospitals in most places are empty. Right. So like the whole idea was that it, it would reduce mortality from the most severe cases who needed to be on the ventilator, which is mostly these people, who, you know, the most sickly among our population, right? Which are the people every year who are the people that population is dying from the flu also, unless they can get into an intensive care unit. But yeah, so like that whole idea that we're reducing the number of cases 
I think is false. And, uh, you know, nobody really knows. Again, I haven't heard it explicitly stated that, no, we're not trying to reduce the number of cases. We're just trying to reduce the number of cases that need to be admitted to the intensive care unit all at once. And I wish they would say that because that lack of clarity has politicized this thing and made it seem like there's, um, you know, we're not doing what we intended. But I don't think that we ever intended <laughs> to do anything other than what I just said, which is reduce the number of people who need to be on a ventilator all at once because we only have a limited number of those. Yes, yes. And I had Ivor Cummins on, and he's spoken to a lot of people and dissect a lot of the data to show this. The actual the lockdowns don't actually prevent the cases. They don't change the trajectory of the amount of cases because the virus kind of runs its own path, course, right? It's it's like he was just showing that respiratory diseases have their own sort of bell curve and rise and fall. And yes, you can do some social distancing and, and that's great. But the, the actual like locking down doesn't actually change how many people are going to get it in total, or it actually didn't change. Because if you look at countries that locked down early or cities or countries that locked down late, the curve was actually basically the same. And so, <laughs> and also, like you said, yes, there's no, no one has ever proved that it's going to diminish the amount of cases overall and that Sweden could be long term in the best shape because they're going to have all these antibodies and then next time they're going to be better off. Right. So, but Brian, to answer the question of why didn't they, commu- I mean, you might be wondering, so why didn't they communicate that clearly? If that was really what they were after is, no, we're not trying to, we, we can't guarantee we're going to reduce the number of cases, but we can guarantee we're going to keep the ICUs from being flooded so that people can't be admitted into the ICU when they need to be. If they had said that, do you think we would have shut down the economy? Uh, no, I, I mean, that's a great point. I don't think, yeah, we would. I think we would have. And so that is where you can start to get legitimately now, get into some weird conspiracy theories. Why didn't we just say what we were actually trying to do? And why did we kind of like twist everybody's arm by kind of implying that we were going to be reducing the number of cases when no epidemiologist in their right mind, I don't think actually believed that. But we let the public and the media put that message out there so that we were terrifying people enough that they would lock down. That's part of it. So I was thinking about this and I read the book Sapiens a long time ago, not to be confused with my company, Sapien. Yuval Harari wrote the book Sapiens, and it's about stories that people have to believe in stories, right? It's this whole, it's a great book, best book ever. But I think they needed the whole world to buy into a story, and <laughs> right? It's, the story is if you wear a mask when you're riding a bike by yourself in the middle of nowhere, you're saving the world. And, and the only way to do this is to get everyone on the same page. And that was their idea of how to make this work. And so everyone had to buy in. And then they even, there's a UK document exposed that they said, let's use the media to create fear mongering to get people to comply with this, right? It's like, this is the agenda was to get everyone on board with this so that we all complied. Right. Yes. And then, you know, there's people who take advantage of that by looking at, you know, what that's going to do the stock market and yada, yada. Right. So there's people that get rich off of these kinds of um, manipulations of public behavior. <laughs> and I don't even know what the conspiracy is because I've heard all kinds of theories. I'm like, I don't really think there is some grand conspiracy, but I'm very curious just what is going on here. And we're so divided. You're right. It's so political now. It's so divided. And if you don't want to wear a mask, all of a sudden you're a Trump supporter. It's super <laughs> weird. Yeah. It's like everyone's going crazy these days. Yeah. It, right. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of it just stems from that, like, not the lie about flattening the curve, but the the on purpose lack of clarity about what would happen. Because I've seen people draw the flattened curve radically differently depending on what side of the aisle they're on, right? Like, mm-hmm. so you have a very skinny peak and a very wide kind of big flat park, which makes it just intuitively, the area under the curve is much huger with a flattened curve on that particular diagram, which makes you afraid of flattening the curve, make it look like it's a bad thing that or there's going to be more people dying. Or you can draw a very tall and kind of wide peak and a very tiny, minute flattened curve 
where, so that the area under the curve with the flattening is tiny. And I, I kind of think that's where we went with, I mean, that is where we went with this, con- with the country and the media putting that artificial idea of a flattened curve out. And it may be the case that as Ivor Cummins said, that you can't really change the area under the curve, period. Mm-hmm. Or you can't change viruses, just do their thing. Yeah. It, right. right. It kind of seems yeah. like, and it, and a lot of people in our world, I don't know if you're in my world or not, <laughs> but and a lot of people in our world are just showing that it's just exposing our weakness as a society or the health. That's the big issue. And I don't want to be disrespectful to people who are metabolically damaged because it's terrible. And there's, you know, we're already there. So I can't just say, oh my God, everyone should be like me. But it's exposing this virus is kind of exposing how metabolically unhealthy we are. That's the bigger problem. There's always viruses. And I always say, like, I don't get sick anymore. I'm always exposed to the flu each year. But it's because my body is healthy, I can get a viral load and just keep going and be fine. And it's like, why are we focusing on the virus? It's the focus should be on people's health. Right. And that's the last one of the last things I said on the Bill Marsha was that getting these oils out of your body fat is not just about getting rid of Corona, right? It's about avoiding all metabolic disease, which we have not really begun to comprehend just how it's affecting us because we've been siloing metabolic disease as, oh, type two diabetes, right? Well, I'm not a type two diabetic, so I'm healthy. Whoa, no way. (laughs) You can't Mm -hmm. go there. Or, you know, we've been siloing it as obesity too, or, you know, as a few of these more severe organ dysfunction disorders, that that's metabolic disease. But no, metabolic disease begins the minute you're not metabolically flexible because metabolic flexibility is the key to health. I mean, one of the biggest keys that there is, right? We're talking Mm -hmm. about energy and none of your cells can survive without energy. Your cells are not like there's just these little spheres of uh, like water balloons that are just sitting there. Mm -hmm. They are these incredibly intricate um, metropolises of transportation and replication and synthesis. They're just like little cities. And what is a city during a blackout? It's chaos. <laughs> Very often. It used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, you, your city can't function without electricity, without energy. Neither can your cells, neither can your body. So it's not the only aspect of health. There are a lot of others. And I talk about those in deep nutrition. You know, you want to have healthy connective tissue. Um, you want to have healthy DNA. You want to have t- proper DNA expression. You, you need a lot of nutrients. But the energy equation part of it, the metabolic flexibility, which means flipping back and forth from burning the calories and whatever you just ate to burning your own body fat, that is the key to metabolic health and, and the key to, to good energy. Uh, and I think a lot of folks, I want to just point out um, that folks think that their metabolism is healthy if it's fast. Like mm. that's, yeah, yeah, that's a common phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like I, I gained weight because my metabolism slowed down because I'm older. Wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Metabolism didn't slow down. In fact, just sitting there as an overweight person, you're burning more calories per minute than a healthy weight person. Not just because there's more of you, but because you are, um, using more oxygen to produce less energy. That's what burning calories actually is. Your metabolism is actually, you're burning more calories with less effort as an overweight person. You could argue that that is faster, although I wouldn't argue that. But um, you definitely don't want a faster metabolism because you already have that. (laughs) What you want is a more efficient, flexible metabolism that is going to flip more easily, like I said, be metabolically flexible, be able to burn your body fat better. So the beginning of metabolic disease, which is the beginning of cancer and the beginning of Alzheimer's and the beginning of all these scary diseases um, and the beginning of susceptibility to the coronavirus is losing your ability to burn body fat. And that begins with eating the wrong kinds of fats. And the the day that you decide you're going to stop doing that is the day that you say yes, not just to weight loss, not just to having a healthier metabolism, but to optimizing your health and living your fullest life. I love that. That's such a great message. And yeah, they're just stuck in sugar burning mode and have the bad oils. And most good diets, like any good diet has that in common, right? Any good diet around the world or throughout history, the people are metabolically flexible. 
you know, you look at say the Okinawan diet and it's like, oh, that they, they have high carb or, you know, they're eating a lot of sweet potatoes and, but they have fish and, you know, stuff like that. Well, they're not eating the seed oils and they're also not eating all the time. They're not eating the refined foods. So they are able to tap into their body fat when they're not eating. Right. Yeah. So it's like, that's the common theme of all good diets is it's hard for some people to figure out in the low carb community. Cause they're just so tied to like carbs are bad. But it's like you can have carbs in your diet and still be metabolically flexible. You can have carbs in your diet and still be producing ketones. You don't have to be on a ketogenic diet. You just have to eat less frequently, right? Because let's say you do have some kind of a Japanese rice porridge for breakfast, but your metabolism is healthy. So it's going to very efficiently, quickly put all those calories in storage as body fat. And then... Now, a couple hours later, you're releasing that body fat. And once you release body fat and your insulin levels are low because you're healthy, you can start, your liver will start producing ketones so that your brain doesn't have to freak out about blood sugar. Yeah. I just, I do need to correct, like, you know, it's not like within a few hours after eating a super high carb meal, unless you're doing a lot of exercise. Yes. I mean, you can still be on a super high carb meal and produce ketones very shortly after eating. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's wrap this up here. This is great. I love this. I think I'm going to run with my seed oil intolerant idea and just tell (laughs) people. I think I think that'd be great if people just say that and then, or even just think that and go about their life that way. And I think that'd be very helpful. And update on the Food Lies film. Everyone's wondering. You know, we're working on it daily. We're going to go out to the East Coast and we have to film a few more things. And maybe we'll catch you for some of that. I would love to be part of that project. You said uh, I'm doing the books you'd want to do. You're doing the movie I'd want to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we all need this movie. Yeah, this is the film. That's why it's taking so long too, is we're trying to do like the ultimate film. And everyone in our you know community, our, our nutrition world probably wants this film to be made, but we want it to be made right. You know, it's so hard to get it. And you only have like an hour, 40 minutes. Like you can't really go longer. So every word counts. So that's why it's taking so long. <laughs> Can you end with um, an Amish paradise? Because I think if we all went Amish, everybody would be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. You know, they're living off the land. They're doing their thing. They're eating whole foods. I love it. All right. I'm so glad you made it on Bill Maher and got the mainstream audience to hear these messages. Any last words? Well, I think we covered a lot, but um, <laughs> I do like I was kind of you know joking about the Amish Paradise, but you interviewed um, Alan Savory. He is mm-hmm. probably my favorite person right now because until I encountered his work, there was no good news about the environment. I, you know, I was depressed about it. Right, I wasn't walking around you know being glum and it was sad. But that the regenerative ranching, regenerative farming. That gives me hope that, you know, the environment that we are leaving for future generations, we can actually make it better so that the future generations, there are future generations that so that, right? <laughs> yeah. Change. There may not be. But like this movie that you're making is this whole message that I think a lot of people in this world is just that is the key for long term human survival. Otherwise, we're talking about chud. <laughs> yeah. I love that. They do. The Savior Foundation has this message. People ask, oh, can we do, can regenerative agriculture, you know, feed the world? And they say, it's the only way it can feed the world. Absolutely. Right? It's the only way. We, the, the monocrop, the system of industrial agriculture is ruining the soil. It's the way we're going to fail. So it's not, can it feed the world? It's the only way. And there is enough land and great message to go out on. (laughs) Thank you so much. And we'll uh, try to connect to see if we can get out to film with you. I love it. It's beautiful down here. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Take care. (laughs) You too. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. I can't wait to talk to Dr. Bill Schindler tomorrow and get another good podcast out next week. Check out sapien.org and become a member of the Sapien tribe there. And that's about it. Come back next week and I'll see you. Stay safe.